Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, an inside look at the Pentagon's most secretive plane. Plus, what is Russia's digital threat and how prepared is NATO to deal with it? Daniel Wolfolk speaks to the former president of Estonia, who led his country through a massive cyber attack. And later, when a Marine light armored vehicle started dangerously sinking in the Colorado River, it could have ended in tragedy. But it didn't. A Marine who was there that day and later to honor for his actions tells us what happened. It's all that and more this week. In the latest in news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon, this is Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly, I'm Andrea Scott. First up this week, you may have heard rumors of the secretive, quote, doomsday plane that is meant to be a command center for the president in case of nuclear war. But that's not all it's used for. The Air Force calls it the E-4B Night Watch, and we were invited up for a flight. Let's take a look. This highly modified 747 behind me, it's a US Air Force E-4B. It's part of the Night Watch program. It's used as a flying command and control center by the president and other leaders in dire situations such as natural disasters and even nuclear attacks where Air Force One is not an option. It's used in the most dire situations, but the crew inside, they don't want that excitement. Boring is good because our nation doesn't want us to be executing our mission. This is one of the only missions in the military that you don't want us actually executing. This is the conference room of the E-4B, this nicknamed by civilians, the Doomsday Plane. In a dire situation like a nuclear disaster, the President of the United States will sit in this chair and lead the nation. This plane is a flying communication suite that can reach any person on Earth. So I want people to understand what we do. As a taxpayer, I want them to know what their money is doing. I want them to have confidence that our nation has communication capabilities in a time of a crisis. It may not be a nuclear event with a, a near peer like Russia or China. What if it's a power grid failure and that wakes up the president and we need to have that capability on board to make sure that everyone has all the communication capability. So it's the unknowns that would may arise. Uh, maybe it's uh, supporting FEMA with uh, some type of flood uh, recovery. We've done that before in the past. We don't necessarily bring FEMA on the aircraft and give them 5,000 square foot of office space, but we'll provide them communication capability. That's really what the nation gets out of us. So yes, we are a Department of Defense platform, but we do other things outside of Department of Defense. Uh, I get to fly. That's really exciting. Um, I'm a, just a communications officer by trade. Uh, we sit on the ground and normally I'm making sure the general gets his email, right? Uh, this is one of the few jobs in the Air Force where a comm officer, like me, gets to fly in an airplane. So I'm going to live that up to the fullest extent possible. Uh, Do you ever think about like, what your job means for you know, national security, kind of big picture? Every day, doing? yep. That's one of the coolest things about this position is seeing um, the, the impact directly. Rachel, you and I recently returned from Nebraska where we took a ride on the E-4B night watch plane. Most people know it as the doomsday plane where if there's a nuclear attack, the president can leave the nation from that plane. It's a big communication center. It's basically flying com command and control room. What kinds of missions does the E-4B see these days? Sure. So the E-4B is turning 60 years old this year, um, you know, big milestone for one of the, you know, kind of most unique missions in the Air Force. Um, right now, it's, it's used primarily to, you know, fly around the Secretary of Defense, um, you know, kind of keep an eye on, you know, how to communicate with troops overseas, uh, troops at home, connect the Defense Secretary to, you know, the White House if need be. And I think that came in handy very recently when Secretary Austin 
went to Kiev, and the story went out saying that even though he was in a war zone, in an austere location, he was still in his chain of command. He could still, if there was some sort of nuclear incident, he would still be in that, in that chain and being able to use, presumably because he's being accompanied by that E-4B. Yeah, yeah. It, um, it can connect to any phone line, you know, cell phone, landline. It can read texts, uh, emails, I believe. It can, you know, funnel in TV stations. So anything that the defense secretary needs to kind of be on top of, you know, what, what's happening in the world, uh, this plane can, can connect him to it. And, you know, it's also used to make big decisions when the time for big decisions comes. Um, so one of the examples that they gave us on the plane was um, he was part of a video conference with the president and with other, you know, members of the national security apparatus when they made the decision to withdraw troops from Afghanistan. Um, so obviously it's a very, you know, it's a very secure but also very important national asset. We were also told that not only does it get used for doomsday scenarios and travel for the Secretary of Defense, but it's not just a DOD asset, it's a federal asset. What other parts of the federal government use this? FEMA calls on it um, in, you know, in times of natural disasters. It can, you know, it can provide a conduit for getting first responders uh, connected to the people that they need to be connected with. Um, it lets, you know, the federal government talk to governors, uh, state legislators, you know, any anybody kind of on the ground that needs to be in the know for situations like that. This is a really old plane. It's a 747. I think this one in particular used to be part of China Air. If I remember correctly, it goes in and out of maintenance, and there are several of these. What is the maintenance cycle like, and how does that leave an impact on the unit? So there, there are maintainers that work on it every day, you know, just fixing the, you know, the little things that, that go wrong or the big things that go wrong every day. Um, but then it does go through month-long cycles of maintenance, you know, to really kind of uh, get in and take the time to, you know, fix the, uh, the stuff that, that requires a little more effort, right? Um, and, you know, so they've got really specialized people that, you know, can work on, I think there's 42 different radars and antennas and things like that. So they have the specialists to work on those. Um, but also the specialists from, you know, Boeing and, and other subcontractors that can work on, you know, what is essentially a Boeing, you know, a, a Boeing platform. The program is turning 60 years old. It's quite remarkable for, for a program. What is the future of it? Um, it's kind of in flux right now. Um, you know, for several years they've been talking about what comes next for the E-4B and the E-6, which is the Navy's version. Um, the Navy's plane can send launch commands to uh, America's nuclear arsenal. The E-4 can't do that, so there's been some conversation about combining them into one platform. Um, as of right now, it looks like that's not the direction that they're going in. Um, so, you know, the Air Force has to come out and say what it's going to do with the E-4. Um, you know, they've said they want a smaller, uh, I believe, you know, kind of business jet sort of airframe for it. Uh, some of the airmen that I talked to said they don't really understand how you could uh, shrink the mission into a smaller jet. It was a snug fit even in a 747. It was, it was. I mean, you know, machines that remind you of war games, you know, from the 60s and 70s are not small, <laughs> you know, the, the, the kind of shrunk down technology that we have today. So, um, you know, they, they may find a way of, of fitting it into a smaller plane, um, but that's to be determined. All right, Rachel, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. When we come back, the former president of Estonia looks at Russia's cyber capabilities and how ready its opponents are to fight them. And later, the Air Force's new trainer jet, the 7A Red Hawk, makes its debut. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. In 2007, a cyber attack wreaked havoc on Estonia. Several other Baltic nation services and businesses were hit, and the attack was ultimately attributed to Russian hackers. The country has since become a leader in cybersecurity and digital living. In fact, its citizens can vote online. The country has also helped other nations strengthen their own cyber capabilities, namely Ukraine, which was hit in 2015 by a massive Russian cyber operation that took out power to much of the country. 
leading Estonia during that time frame was Thomas Hendrik Ilves. I recently spoke to Mr. Ilves about Russia's digital threat for this week's actionable intelligence. Mr. President, welcome. Can you tell me a little bit about the Russian threat right now in terms of cyber for the neighbors in, in, in Eastern Europe? It's been, it's been rather high for uh, quite a while. Uh, in many ways, the story is not the Russian threat today, but rather uh, the, um, the absence of full-blown cyber warfare against Ukraine seems like they, their capabilities have progressed throughout the years, or is it that they haven't used them yet and they're focused more on a land war right now? No, I think, I mean, what we learned from the Russians over the years, especially after uh, 2008 in Georgia, when they combined cyber attacks with uh, kinetic attacks, that they're actually quite good. Um, I suspect that the, uh, the this lower than expected uh, uh, intensity of cyber attacks perhaps has more to do with kind of a, I don't know what you call it, a, a mutually assured destruction paradigm that they realize that the Ukrainians are not bad at all and, uh, and give as good as they get. And in that kind of situation, maybe you want to temper what you do lest um, you trigger something in response. And of course, the other side of this, or the another additional element to this, is that, uh, at least from what I've read, I uh, that the um, all kinds of other activists and cyber people from outside Ukraine who are not necessarily Ukrainian have also been doing things. So it seems that they're facing a lot at this point, because of course, uh, the sympathies of those people who are capable of doing something, which are mainly people in the West, uh, are not with Russia. Uh, so um, so any, in any case, the, the, the bottom line is that we're seeing less than uh, people anticipated, which is kind of sad for me, because I just wrote a long article saying the future of war will be cyber. Is NATO prepped? Is it prepared to, to really have a counterattack if there is a major cyber attack from Russia? It's one of the biggest weaknesses of NATO is that uh, the, the cyber capabilities are much more national and nationally based than other than kinetic warfare. Now, the reason for that is that cyber grew out of the sort of intelligence, I mean, paradigm, where you're much less apt to share things, which is, I think, a fundamental problem that we need to resolve within the alliance. When you go into the digital or cyber realm, I mean, there's no mass. There's no distance on Earth, at least, I mean, because it travels at the speed of light, and there is no time difference. So I'd like to say that Tallinn, Torino, Toronto, Topeka, and Tokyo, they're all equidistant in the cyber realm. And this leads us to another sort of, I mean, should make us rethink the concept of alliances in cyber and the digital era. And we're moving very, very slowly in this direction. But rather we should, instead of just look, thinking geographically, we don't, we don't need to, and in many cases, we don't really shouldn't think geographically when it comes to cyber, but rather really create a genuine cyber alliance based on adherence to democratic values, freedom of speech, which allows you to actually have a much broader alliance. I mean, certainly, you know, Japan is just as much a liberal democracy as any country in NATO, maybe more so in certain cases. Um, and I, I would say that, and, you know, and it doesn't just have to be those big ones. I mean, Uruguay in Latin America is a, is a fine democracy with high digital, uh, I mean, development, there's no reason why Uruguay couldn't be in, and they're, they're probably more vulnerable as well, that we really need to think the whole concept of, of alliances uh, in this current era.
And now for defense dollars. The U.S. Air Force and Boeing unveiled the service's new fleet of trainer jets, the T-7A Red Hawk. The event, held in a Boeing facility at Lambert Airport last Thursday, marked the first delivery of 351 planned T-7s, which will replace the more than five-decade-old T-38 Talon aircraft. Boeing received a $9.2 billion contract in 2018 to create and deliver the Air Force's new trainer, which was designed to teach pilots to fly fourth and fifth generation aircraft. The T-7 was named in honor of the famed Tuskegee Airmen of World War II. That's the first squadron of black fighter pilots who broke racial boundaries and were nicknamed the Red Tails after the plane's distinctive markings. The T-7's own Red Tails are another nod to that legacy. Columbia's Air Force has chosen to mix the TA-50 and FA-50 Golden Eagles as its next jet trainers. That's according to military sources who talked to Defense News. The planes are made by Korea Aerospace Industries. The Colombian Air Force plans to acquire at least 20 advanced jet trainers with air-to-air -air and air-to-ground combat capabilities under a project estimated to be worth $600 million. Thanks, Daniel. Artillery promised to Ukrainian forces by the White House has been making its way to Europe thanks to a combination of airmen and Marines. Troops at California's March Air Reserve Base have been loading howitzers onto C-17s to get them to the fight. The weapons are part of a broad aid package provided by the U.S. And in the Navy, hundreds of sailors will be moved off the aircraft carrier George Washington, following an influx of suicides and deaths among the crew. A CO told the crew recently that about 260 sailors will head to onshore barracks living areas. The George Washington is in a years-long overhaul in Newport News, Virginia. Crew members have complained of bad living conditions aboard the carrier, including constant construction noise and a lack of hot water and power. And the Honor Flight Network hit a major milestone this week when it escorted its 250,000th veteran to the Capitol. The group, which flies veterans from around the country to visit war memorials in Washington, D.C., held a special event at the World War II Memorial to commemorate the benchmark. Veterans spoke about what it meant to be able to make the trip to see the memorial. This is the first time you've been to the memorial? Yes, it is. So what do you think? Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Honor flights were largely curtailed during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, but have recently been able to resume. The program began in 2005 as a way to allow war veterans who might not be able to easily travel to Washington to see the nation's monuments. Thanks to Capitol Hill Bureau Chief Leo Shane for the images. When we come back, we dispel some common myths about VA loans on this week's Money Minute. And later, four Marines recently were awarded the Navy and Marine Corps Medal. Find out why. Welcome back. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack gives her latest tips. VA mortgage loans are designed to make the dream of home ownership more attainable for military families. It's a well-deserved perk for your service to your country. It shouldn't come with confusion or misconceptions, so let's clear up some things about the VA loan. By far, the single largest benefit of VA loans is they don't require a down payment. This is a massive benefit. But according to recent research by Navy Federal Credit Union, 45% of active duty service members think they need a down payment of more than 20%. That's $40,000 if you're talking about a $200,000 house. VA loans make it possible to buy a home without spending years saving for that hefty sum. Many service members also feel VA loans are complicated and slow. Almost 60% of active duty and 41% of vets think they take too long to process. But for the past 13 months, we've seen VA loans close slightly faster than conventional mortgages. VA loans provide a ton of great benefits, so get familiar with them. If you're eligible, discuss the option with your lender. It really is the best and easiest way to home ownership. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next week. To get more of our coverage, be sure to check out our headlines online at Army, Navy, Air Force, and MarineCorpsTimes.com and DefenseNews.com. To get a list of our top stories in your inbox every weekday, subscribe to our Early Bird Brief. And make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And when we come back, a 2019 training accident might have ended in tragedy when a Marine light armored vehicle started sinking in the Colorado River. Stay tuned to see what happened.
Welcome back. When then First Lieutenant Timothy Cattell's unit was crossing the Colorado River during a training exercise, disaster suddenly struck. A light armored vehicle got caught in an undertow and began taking on water. Cattell leapt into action to help save his fellow Marines. He and three other Marines were recently awarded the Corps' top non-combat heroism medal. I spoke to Cattell at the National Museum of the Marine Corps in Quantico, Virginia, about what happened that day. We were crossing the Colorado River, and uh, when the vehicle went in, um, it basically got caught a little bit of the undercurrent of the Colorado River, uh, which pushed it around facing upstream, and uh, the vehicle started taking on more water. Since I was the XO, I was standing on the beach, and uh, as they were struggling, they, it was taking a while to get the driver out of the driver's hole. So I figured if it was, had to, like, we needed to open up the hatch to go in and grab him. So uh, myself and uh, the platoon commander, Captain Williams, jumped in the water and swam to uh, the safety boat uh, because it was hooked up or stuck on the LEV. Um, after that, by the time we got there, the driver was uh, unconscious but out of the vehicle. After we got into the safety boat, we checked his airway, breathing, and circulation. Um, and then we rolled into CPRs, myself and Captain Williams. Uh, so then I was by his head and he was by his chest, just the way it laid out. So I just did the initial two safety or the initial two breaths uh, since it was a waterborne uh, CPR or drowning CPR. And then um, proceeded, he proceeded with the compressions and then we just kept that rhythm until he uh, started regaining consciousness. Um, it was good, like, every, everyone, everyone was happy about the results of the situation, so everyone was pretty grateful, and uh, the Marines there that day, like, everyone had a great attitude and great personality for the situation, since that, um, like, he wanted to stay with the platoon and keep going, keep training with the platoon, which just speaks to the resiliency of Marines. I wasn't the only one who did anything here. Uh, the actions and the results would not be the same if the other Marines weren't there um, and everyone wasn't doing their role. I said Captain Williams, Staff Sergeant Dupree, and Sergeant Tarswish, they all played critical roles. It's kind of just doing what was expected, I guess. So I'm very humbled by this. Um, I was not expecting this at all. This is very, uh, it's just very humbling. Like, like I said, it's, in my mind, I was just doing what was expected and what if another XO, Marine, enlisted officer, just anyone would do um, that day in that same shoes. And that's all we have time for this week. Please visit us on MilitaryTimes.com and DefenseNews.com for more coverage. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week with coverage from Modern Day Marine.